right, so for today's video, I wanted to film one of my friend and colleagues experiments to show you what she is doing. She's working with some sea hares, which are very different than the organisms I've worked on in my PhD and the current project that I'm also running. I think during a PhD in particular, you can get hyper focused. I mean, you kind of have to hyper focus on your species that you're working with, your particular experiment. You can kind of miss some of the cool stuff that's going on around you. So I wanted to do a little video to show what JD's doing for her experiment and to show you some really cool and super cute sea hares. So let's go find her. Okay, let's go find her. Here she is. Hello. So here she is. Here is her experiment. So what are you doing over here, Jade? So we're creating ocean acidification conditions and exposed sea hares, those little kitties to severe ocean acidification and see how they respond in terms of behavior and molecular response in their brain. Or at least the closest that they have to a brain. Closest that they have to a brain, so they don't have an actual brain? They're not centralized. Okay. The neurons are spread across the body. They're very large neurons that you can see with the bare eye, say you would dissect one. And this is why they're very interesting creatures to work with, because they're very easy. And you can look at the neuron level, what is going on with future conditions. Here is the CO2. So that is how she is creating or simulating severe ocean acidification in the tank. So she'll bubble the CO2 into the water and it will become more acidified. So what exactly are you doing right now? So I'm measuring the pH um, to make sure that the bubbling is going fine and that we are actually having future conditions. So these bubblers are going at 1,200 microatmospheres of CO2, which would be what we would have in 100 years if things get bad. Things get bad. So what kind of things do you have to do on a daily basis for their general maintenance and health brain? For general care, you have to know that these eat a lot, then poop a lot. Eat a lot, So a lot. cleaning and feeding is part of something that's very regularly. So yes, they're fed once every three days. Once every three days. But every day I have to clean their tanks because otherwise it gets messy. Yeah. So in order to avoid two big CO2 fluctuations, we opted for a flow-through system. It's in three parts. First one would be the reservoirs, which are up there. Big water containers have a storage of water. The water goes down by gravity into what are called the experimental tanks, where the sea hairs live and where the CO2 is bubbling from. And finally, this water is basically being recycled thanks to a bottom filter tank. Well, this filter tank has three compartments. The first one would be a filter sheet compartment where the big pieces of algae or feces that might end up in there would be filtered. There's a bottom of bio rings where bacteria would start removing some nitrate. Nitrate is the nutrient that enters the water as the feces decompose and it's toxic for the sea hairs so we don't want them to be there. The second would be, as you can see here, a skimming compartment with a protein skimmer. Since the sea hairs produce a lot of mucus, we kind of want to break it down so that it doesn't go back up in the reservoir the same. If this decomposes, we get a very nasty water that the sea hairs will not be having it. And finally, you get the third compartment, which is just a pump that would send all the filtered water back into the reservoir. So we're going to demonstrate the feeding. So we'll look at this guy here. He's actually looking for food. So they have a um, thick tongue, you could think like cats, it's called radula. The little hooks on the tongue is what allows them to feed. So the white thing is their tongue? Yes. It has a groove shape. It's all about catching some algae, taking a piece out of the big piece and then swallow it directly. It really freaks me out. <laughs> I can't decide if I love it or if I hate it. So this is their food? Yes. This is the red algae, it's called agarriela. Lots of red pigment that they use to produce their ink. Because yes, see here's ink, just like octopus. I didn't know that! Yep. Ah. A very bright purple ink. Ah. You so what would mess with them too much. So what would make them ink? Stress? Or punches! <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> They're really chill animals, but yeah. and they live in the waves. Right. really find them on the beaches site. They hit a rock or they're being attacked by natural predators, which are very few, but lobster, for instance, they would ink so that 
the water gets very, very thick and the predator can't see you. You always have to be gentle when you take them out, otherwise they ink on you. Hello! Sea hares are intertidal species, which means that they live where the waves break. So sometimes they can be naturally emerged, even though they don't really like it, but their flaps are protecting the gills. Oh my god, they're mouth! No. They usually are where seaweed that they like is. Once they reach adulthood, which means sexual maturity, you'll find them in groups of five, six, seven, wow. up to ten. And that's by ten that they mate. They don't do couples, they do tens. Up to tens or even more. So sea hares are also hermaphrodites, which means that they're both male and female at the same time. So that means that any other sea hares is a potential partner for mating. A bit easier? Uh, yes, yeah. When you're so slow, <laughs> if you find somebody, you just gotta stick with it. <laughs> Can I hold one? I've never had one before. So this is Jade's PhD, um, one of her PhD study species, and this is my one. <laughs> squishy? Not squishy. <laughs> Definitely not squishy. It feels so strange. I'm used to handling these guys, which are a lot sturdier, and this one's super, super delicate. Squishy, not squishy. Is a sea hare the same thing as a nudibranch or are they different things? They're very closely related, but actually they're not nudibranches. Okay, nudibranches are called nudie branches because they're naked. They don't have a shell anymore compared to other mollusks. Sea hares are opisto branches. They have a shell, but it's inside, it's hidden. The um, shape of a sea hare always has this central pole area. And that's where this inner shell is. What is this little appendage here, this little spout? This back? is a little tube shaped thing which is called the siphon. The siphon is used to exhale literally everything. The water that they breathe out, urea, their equivalent of urea, and feces. And when they reproduce, they lay eggs as well. Does the moustache have a purpose? Is it a sensory appendage? It definitely has a purpose. It's their biggest sensory appendage. It helps them to find seaweed. There are sensors, mechanical sensors. You can see their moustache going, finding some stuff. But also, like their nose. And when it's time to reproduce, the moustache is also an organ that can sense the mucus of other seniors. Uh, they will find the trail, basically. Question, why are they called sea hares? Simply because they've got rabbit ears. They've got rabbit ears. One interesting feature about those ears, so there are sensors, right? Like the moustache or other appendices. But what I find so cute is that when they sleep, they ball up. Most of the body is contracted into a ball. And the head is a bit retracted. So the ears go... That's so cute. So cute. <laughs> That's so cute. After exposing them to three weeks of elevated CO2, uh, I'm first going to look at their behavior. I'm targeting a reflex behavior on the tail. Basically, if you punch them a little bit on the tail, they will retract. Okay. I'm going Do to you just say how... punch. Pinch. Pinch. Okay, pinch. Yeah. <laughs> Pardon my French. <laughs> I'm going to pinch them just a little bit on the tail, and the sea hairs will retract in response to that. And that's a reflex response. Okay. It's been shown that under high CO2 levels, like the ones we're creating now, this reflex is less intense and less long than sea hairs which are exposed to normal day CO2. I'm going to do that experiment again, but at the same time I'm going to collect the neurons which are involved in this behavior and look at the gene expression levels that you find in those neurons. See if there's any difference between sea hairs which are exposed to future CO2 conditions and control CO2 conditions. So that was a little introduction into Jay's experiment. It's really cool for me to see because she's using similar techniques. So she's exposing them to the same thing, which I exposed my sea urchins, but obviously it was a very, very different experiment and different setup. So yeah, that was very cool. I am now gonna clean out my sea urchins. So thank you so much for watching. If you wanna find Jade, on social media i'll put a link to all of that below thanks again for watching and i'll see you next time bye